Right. Um, so yes, I, I, I'm a fairly small Venn diagram overlap of people with a, who are chartered civil engineers with a civil engineering road and bridge design background and a psychology degree because knowing a lot about polymer modified bitumen binder doesn't do me much in helping understand how humans will behave. Um, mm -hmm. And my take is you can never underestimate the ability of hu humans to confound everything you think that they will actually do. So I'm very interested in that interface. What's on? Yeah. It's on here, it doesn't match what's on there. Um, the, the interface of um, humans and, and roads, essentially. Uh, so I'm going to briefly run through what does connected mean, what does autonomous mean. People tend to talk about connected and autonomous vehicles as it's just one thing, but it's a bunch of inter, inter, interlacing things. Um, a little bit about some of the barriers to connectedness and autonomy. Um, and the kind of safety and reliability pros and cons. In 30 years in road design and road safety, I've never found any highway intervention that doesn't have both beneficial and adverse effects. So I'm interested in making sure we drill into as many of those as we can. And some of the real world challenges. Um, this image at the bottom is a great example of how um, it's easy to overestimate how much people don't cope with change. We often say people don't cope with change. When early horse-drawn vehicles came in, some of the manufacturers decided it would be a good idea to stick a, a model horse's head on the front of a motor car because people would feel more confident if the thing that looked like a horse and carriage had a horse's head on the front. In hindsight, it's a ridiculous idea, but it does actually help us think about the disruptive, disruptive capability of autonomous vehicles. They're not going to look just like a bog standard car does now, but with different technology. They're going to be completely different sorts of things. Um, and the impacts of that are quite interesting. How will people respond to something that looks more like, I don't know, a movable office when they're used to behaving uh, in respect of uh, vehicles moving around? So there's, there's lots of scope for quite interesting consequences. So definitions. <coughs> a connected vehicle is one that talks to other stuff. So there's a vehicle to vehicle infrastructure. You talking to the vehicle in front of you and behind you. Um, the vehicle uh, advising the vehicle behind of an obstruction coming up. Um, a vehicle talking to infrastructure, so that's the vehicle telling the infrastructure where it is, about speed, about, um, you know, ultimately we might have things like, you know, sensors on vehicles, telling the mothership what, what the you network know, conditions are like and so on. Um, and conversely, the, the infrastructure, the mothership talking to the vehicle, telling it, I know you're planning to go down that road to get to your destination, but actually there's a gas main explosion 10 minutes ago, you can't go down that route, where are you going to go instead? Um, the interest in that when you get hybrid semi-autonomous is quite interesting. When the human is still involved, that's, for me, that's where the interest comes. Um, so that's the connected bit. The autonomous bit is uh, stages of um, technology that assist <coughs> the driver. Um, and then a connected and autonomous vehicle is something that combines those. So it's hard to imagine you would have a... Uh, an autonomous vehicle that didn't have connectedness, but you could have a connected vehicle that doesn't have autonomy. So um, we need to think of the two elements. So levels of automation, um, we've got uh, level zero at the top, bog standard, Morris Minor, anything, you know, bog standard car with no assistance. Level one is some driver assist technology, adaptive cruise control, intelligent speed adaptation, or um, assist, assist, assistance speed, autonomous braking, plan for um, e-directive to mandate uh, some of these interim technology assistance um, in the meantime. Level two becomes part of automation, so autopilot technology on Tesla, for example. Our gut instinct is, as we step up through these things, it's all bound to get better. But people have a confounding ability in the face of computing to do things that make it worse. So I've been for my, my final year project and my psychology degree was uh, into attitudes to autonomous and connected vehicles and reading a lot of research about, um, for example, level two vehicles, people in a level two vehicle, so Tesla autopilot, which can drive point to point on the motorway, uh, knowing they are being videoed on, on driving on road, it's not in a simulator, driving on road, the average time between the Tesla saying, I'm coming up to the exit where we're going to leave and I don't do diverging on my own, so you need to put your hands back on the wheel, and the human putting their hands back on the wheel, 77 seconds. Mm -hmm. That's where they're being videoed by a researcher. How long do they take when they're not being videoed? The average time between uh, somebody in a highly automated vehicle taking back control of that vehicle, having anticipated taking control of the vehicle, uh, to get fully stable, longitudinally and laterally, control in lane and stable, 35 to 45 seconds. 
it would be like really long distances at 70 miles an hour, which is probably where these things will happen. So these staged uh, it technologies bring progressive benefits, but humans' ability to do confounding adverse things. So we foresee a technology roadmap where uh, the levels roll out. We have a mixed fleet. Mixed fleet for me is the big scary thing. We just don't know how humans will respond in the, the presence of non-humans, other humans, and so on. So uh, some of these things will, will be beneficial in absolute terms. Some of them will be adverse. But the, the interface is the chaos for me. And trying to think about what does that mean for the, the infrastructure? What does that mean to a highway authority who owns thousands of kilometres of roads? So why would we want autonomy? Eight biggest, least, eight biggest cause of death, 95% of accidents caused by humans, 90% of humans caused by accidents, um, massive increase in delay, lots of adverse impact in, you know, in delays in urban areas. Will autonomous make us more efficient in urban areas? Or we just end up gridlocked because people have a bigger appetite to travel. We don't know really. We should never forget humans' ability to be tired, drunk, drug distracted, doing all the stuff that humans do when they're driving, and yet at the same time mostly do a recent decent stab at it. There's a surprisingly small accident rate given the, the, the kind of travel we've got, but people do manage to get into this kind of scenario of a, I think it was a 100 vehicle pilot um, in fog. We all know you don't drive fast in fog because you might find a vehicle. No shit Sherlock Award, but this is what happens. The benefits uh, of autonomy in this kind of thing, autonomous braking, for me, that should be a massive net benefit on that kind of road. That yes, people do adverse things, but that kind of incident would be much better. So pedestrian and cyclist attitudes on engineered roads, so kind of two broad categories. This is uh, my beloved Aldgate East, um, not specifically, it's a junction of particular relevance, an example of a highly engineered, uh, very high capacity multi-lane road. The theory is that autonomy, um, vehicles reading the instructors speaking to each other become more efficient, better for pedestrians, you know, more efficient traffic and so on. What we're actually seeing is humans doing um, uh, unexpected things. So we're hearing um, tales in California, for example, of what they call Google children, where they've learned to be jump in front of the Google autonomous car, it will stop. So now they jump in front of the Google Street View car, which is just a car with a camera on the roof. And it doesn't stop, it runs them over. That's a great example of human adaptive behaviour in the face of information, explicit or implicit, and a counterintuitive benefit. The flip side of that is the sort of sacred cow concept that the likelihood is probably these vehicles are going to be insured by the manufacturer, probably rather than some abstract company. They're going to be risk averse. They're certainly not going to break the speed limit. No one's going to give you insurance for driving above the speed limit, I wouldn't think to expect. So suddenly we've got herd speed control, which is great, except people weaving in and out in their non-speed controlled vehicles on a motorway, for example. So we could get gridlock. On the unengineered roads, we could get who knows what. So Edinburgh and um, uh, Kensington, Exhibition Road. These kind of roads work because humans aren't quite sure it actually it kind of intuitively makes sense. It actually just, it just works largely. Mostly it's okay. Autonomous vehicles quite like certainty. They like lanes. They like markings. They like definition. Now you can get some of that with, with machine learning. With cars, so the Oxbottica trial in, in Oxford, for example, and there are various other trials where they're just driving the network day after day after day, in daylight, in darkness, in low sun, in high sun, in cloud, in fog, in snow, and learning the network. You could end up with a kind of very defined GPS-based network that says this is where the road is. But what happens when you put your cones out and you divert them to another bit of road? Because Exhibition Road is lots of road without any curbs. How does the vehicle know that it has to go down the new bit of the road, not the old bit of road? Um, fleet owners, I talked about the kind of um, uh, operator bit of uh, risk. Mm -hmm. The human bit of risk is interesting. So. Uh, 1969, they did a survey of 50 drivers, asked them how good they thought they were relative to the average person, and all 50 said they thought they were better than average drivers. Now, interestingly, all 50 were in hospital having caused a major high severity car crash. So then they asked, you know, s some other people who hadn't been involved in car crashes, and funnily enough, they all thought they were better than average as well. Ironically, that sense that we all think we're better than average might be a barrier to take up. 
it might make people think, I don't want this technology, I'm better than the machine. So there's some quite interesting stuff. We could end up with the lowest risk drivers um, in the best cars and the highest risk drivers in the worst cars. That's a net detriment scenario, potentially. So we could get a safety disparity in the mixed fleets in that scenario where we could be much worse than we are at the moment. So some big benefits and some big drawbacks. Parking, automated parking. Anyone driven a car with automated self-parking? Brilliant. What doesn't it do? Unpark. So we're now getting scenarios where your car can put your car in a hole that you can't get out of. <laughs> and unparking is much riskier than parking because you're pulling out it generally into a more difficult scenario. Lines of sight are worse when you're unparking than when you're parking. And the, the machine reading of a whole road that it physically can't see gets more complicated. It's so easy to think it's going to get better. It's a big benefit. 23% of all claims, uh, insurance claims are parking. Um, and 71% of those are reversing. So there's a good argument for this technology, but we've got to consider the, the adverse impact. Similarly, lane assist, a huge benefit of lane assist. So um, it, it reads the road, keeps you in lane. It might be an alert uh, at the lowest end, or it might be an actual lane physical control at the highest end. Again, the youngest drivers and the oldest drivers are uh, more susceptible to overconfidence, a bit faster around the bends in a rural area on unlit roads for the younger driver end might be uh, susceptibility to glare on an unlit rural road for an older driver. This technology has brilliant capabilities, but it might do stuff we don't expect. So this is an example of what we do quite commonly, um, removing centre lines, uh, advisory cycle lanes each side. We had a member of staff who was on a road like this. Uh, the autonomous car, uh, sorry, the, the hire car had lane assist technology, an, an active override lane assist technology, and the car is looking for a centre line and it doesn't find one but it finds something that looks a bit like a centre line and pulls the car into oncoming traffic. That doesn't mean the algorithm would necessarily always do that. That shows somebody liberated that technology without specifying what a lane was. You know, if a lane's six metres it's clearly not a lane, it's two lanes. It's, a, it's an example of how we've already got these problems. This isn't something that might come, it's where we already are. Some of the trickiest barriers to take up for me are the first mile, last mile journey. So first mile, um, two-way road uh, with only one lane of traffic. Humans deal with this quite well. They see a car coming the other way. There's a bit of a gap. I can see the garage down there. Someone will pull into that gap and it works okay. I'm not quite sure what an autonomous vehicle is going to do in this situation. I think you can just sort of see them coming head to head in gridlock. <laughs> are we going, going to have to make all one lane roads, rural and urban, one way? We're going to have to make all single track roads one way. Yeah, the impact in some rural areas is enormous. So there's some really interesting stuff about what the technology can learn to do. And I'm, I'm excited about the possibility of it. Some of the stuff we've do, done to engineer the road is about using human behaviour in a good way. So priority narrowings, I've got mixed feelings about, but the intention is that they make people more careful because someone's coming the other way and they make people slow down. Now, if the autonomous vehicle knows it's got priority, it won't do what the human does, which is say, I know I've got priority, but I can see the car coming the other way. It's doing 35 and a 30, and he's not going to stop, so I'm going to pull back. You might actually find you get more collisions in some situations because engineering devised around humans is not so good at a mixed fleet. Not a fully autonomous fleet, but a mixed fleet. High-speed junctions like this. Think of a human driver pulling out into a fleet where 95% of vehicles have autonomous braking you'll probably pull out into a smaller gap. When the car that's coming towards you doesn't have autonomous braking, it was more likely to hit you. Now, in net terms, that might get better. It's quite hard to tell, but we need to think about it. And the flip side of that is the autonomous vehicle pulling out of this junction on a very busy, I've deliberately picked one, you can see the road layer, but picture lots of busy, single carriageway rural roads. A risk-averse autonomous vehicle may well sit there until both lanes are clear, including the right turn lane, which might be an hour. So what does that do for network efficiency and the driver behind that drives around that vehicle and take, makes a risky turn? Again, we need to think through these scenarios. Q-Assist, technology detects flow breakdown and uh, speed reduction, locks your vehicle onto, onto the vehicle in front. Sounds great, doesn't it? What happens when you get to this location and the vehicle in front of you can see that the opposing lane is clear and dives up the side road. You're going to follow him. What happens when he pulls into his driveway? You're going to follow him. 
we're not quite sure. And I asked these, these questions about manufacturers, and they kind of look at me a bit scant. So um, I think we need to think through some of this stuff. Petrol filling stations or electric charging stations, massively chaotic environments, quite hard to know how we're going to engineer them. Do we end up just closing all these things? Do we end up having to do mass engineering? Will it work in zero light? Now, autonomy potentially can do better with less lines of sight with more detection than humans, so that in many respects that should be better, but we need to think it through. Sometimes the vehicle will be reading road signs, sometimes they'll be reading a database of where the signs are and you don't need the signs, in that situation the vehicle is better than the human, because even when the signs have been knocked down the vehicle still knows to slow down. Motorcycles and cycles I see is very disruptive, um, we're working on a number of um, connected uh, corridors, Scotland and England, you know, uh, expressways, smart motorways, where we're thinking about what does connectedness mean, what does autonomy mean. It's unlikely that a motorcycle is ever going to be connected or autonomous in the sense that a car will be. So does that mean we have to ban them? I don't know. I think it's a good question. Cycles in urban areas. What happens when all the vehicles are autonomous? Probably it will be okay because they'll be better at detecting than humans are. And a mixed fleet, it could, could be quite risky for cyclists. Herds, never, never un underestimate the ability of humans to behave like herd animals. Uh, trials have shown that when an electronic ch electronically locked chain of vehicles is travelling at one second headway, humans start doing it too. They don't think one second is okay, much more subliminal than that. They intuitively copy what's around them. We copy what our neighbours do. We might think we're all independent, but we're actually just um, herd animals and we copy it. So some very complex <coughs> things about um, overtaking and um, headway and spacing um, in the presence of autonomous vehicle queues. And also the drivers of some of these fleets are reporting very high stress levels. Not driving can be more stressful than driving. Um, witness the um, Uber fatal. So in conclusion, I come back to this, this concept, which I actually, I created this slide for a traffic calming presentation but I think it works across virtually everything we do. We need to ask ourselves, is it compliant with the standards, the standards we've got and the standards that are coming? Is it lawful? Does the law need to change? Or do we need to change what we do to make it comply with the law? And is it safe? And it's not binary, a lot of these things. Sometimes it's a bit of what we call Vicky Pollard, or yeah, but no, but you know, it's not really one thing or the other. But we should look out for our Grenfell moment in highways. That when we do something but we think it's fine and we haven't quite thought through the unexpected consequences of what we do. In hindsight, Grenfell was absolutely bloody obvious and yet no one involved really foresaw what was going to happen. We could do the same thing in highways. We don't think these things through. So in conclusion, my personal view, connected autonomous vehicles will have new types of accidents we don't manage, but they'll avoid a lot of the ones that we have ourselves. And my personal perception is the net effect will be beneficial this graphic bottom right is a smart motorway hazard log graphic. The top graphic is before removing the hard shoulder and the bottom graphic is uh, after removing it and it's net risk. Each of these colours is a block of in individual hazards. Some things get worse but lots of things get much better and the net effect is beneficial. That's my personal view is it will be beneficial but it's going to be properly chaotic. And that's me, thank you very much. <laughs>